Hi everyone, my name is Rashid Tuluthar. I'm the developer advocate at MuleSoft. Um, and today I'm going to be basically running through our platform, um, following different integration patterns that might be of interest to you based on what I've heard from uh, Trailhead DX. I don't know how to actually pronounce it. I apologize. Um, so anyway, I did a little bit of research on your personas and stuff like that. You guys have uh, admins and developers and architects and etc. So um, hopefully nobody finds this offensive and if you do just don't send any hate mail to my boss. So I'm going to, if I'm wearing my glasses, I'm an architect, okay? If I am just wearing my shirt, if I'm just wearing my shirt, I'm an admin. And if I am wearing my hoodie, I'm a developer system integrator, <laughs> all right? So the reason why I'm talking about these personas is because our platform actually covers pretty much the whole entire life cycle for any of your integration stories that you might have. Yeah. So I got to show you this thing, I think, I don't know, legal. Um, so this is our agenda for today. Um, really quickly, I want to go over some FAQs that I uh, know you guys have questions about, um, and then I'm going to hit home right away talking about ETL integrations. Um, that was a really common, it seems to be a common story for a lot of Salesforce customers based on what I heard at uh, Trailheadics, so I want to bring that up. And then I want to talk to you guys and show you guys the full breadth and power of the Anypoint platform, uh, which basically involves the full API lifecycle. And then eventually I'll take Q&A. So, FAQs. What's going to happen to MuleSoft now? I don't know. I can't say. The acquisition hasn't completed. What's going to happen to Salesforce Integration Cloud? I don't know. So, but I will say this. MuleSoft in general is platform agnostic. Um, that is kind of what makes us really special which is that we, allow, we have the ability to be able to connect anything to everything. Um, and that's what makes us really special. And lastly, why can't I tell you guys? It's because it's against the law. All right, so going right into it, that's my demo, a uh, slide heavy deck right there. How do I get out of presentation mode? There we go. So going right into it. Um, let me walk you guys through a ETL story, okay? So I run everything in a VM, so let me resize this. So a really common, common pattern, uh, or sorry, let me backtrack. So, so when you're creating integrations, right, there are really two types of ways that you could kind of think about it. It's either going to be event-driven, such as taking an HTTP request, or it can be scheduled. Right? So in a ETL type of integration, what you're going to typically do is create a schedule. So right here, what I have is a project. And I apologize if it's a little bit small. I don't know if I can zoom. Yeah. Too much zoom. Less zoom. OK. It's either all or nothing. Um, anyway, so, so what I have here is a kind of a baseline project. But what I haven't defined uh, with this Mule application project is how it's going to be triggered. What is the source? So like I said, we could either be event-driven or we could be scheduled. In this scenario, I would like to uh, have my project come in and schedule. So let's run this uh, batch job because this will be a ETL integration, right? So really quick, I'm going to go ahead and drop in this scheduler which I got from my meal palette over here, which has all the connectors and different uh, elements that make up a mule application. So at a high level, what we have in this box is called the mule flow. The mule flow is pretty literal. It's a flow of taking a message across and running it through different message processors until you get your desired output, and that's what it outputs. Our mule flow in this scheduler is going to be triggered by a scheduler. We're going to be running our scheduler in this scenario on a fixed frequency. We'll just say once per day. And if you wanted to, and realistically, what would happen is we would run it on a cron job um, where you can set it based on time zone 
and also what your um, like what time in cron. But for our demo purposes, we're just going to run it at, at fre fixed frequency. Okay, great. So we have we have a scheduler that's going to start our mule flow. It's going to be the thing that triggers and starts our application and runs it once a day. Next step here, we have this thing right here called a data weave uh, transformer. Um, huh, things are backwards. Anyway, um, where we're basically taking Sorry, let me backtrack. We have that scheduler, but what if we wanted to take that schedule and add FTP and make it more event driven based on, or sorry, schedule driven based on FTP. We run the FTP once per day, but we actually look for a file. So uh, I have my FTP service here. Uh, live demos. All right, hang on a second. I need to get credentials for my FTV, FTP service. So I want for my for my batch integration. I want to go ahead and get a file from FTP once a day. So I'm going to go in and configure this FTP connector. Need to get the credentials for it. So I'm actually going to developer.mulesoft.com where we can go ahead, where I actually uh, wrote the guide where that I'm, that I'm actually showing you everything up uh, to replicate should you desire to later on. So right now, I'm, I'm globally configuring my FTP service. So I'm filling in username, password, what the location is. I'm going to hit test connection to verify that it works. Um, again, right now, I'm not coding anything. I'm just using the out-of-the-box FTP connector. It tested it against the service itself, found that it, that it works, um, and it's connected, and it's successful. So now I have my FTP service uh, configured. So I need to go ahead and also check only a, one type of file, right? Let's say you have an FTP server. You might have a bunch of different files. But all I want are new customers.csv. So it's going to go ahead and reach out to that FTP service that I, uh, that I configured. It's going to look for new customers only. And it's going to uh, pull those. Um, now, here's something that's actually really special. Um, we have this feature in, uh, called watermarks. And watermarks are basically, it lets you know when the last time or when the last file was updated. Because this connector searches specifically for new or updated files. I'm searching for only the file named new customers. And I want to make sure that I'm not running a, uh, a cron job or whatever and duplicating all the work that I've done, duplicating records. That's a bad thing, right? Um, so that's something that we want to avoid. So what watermarking does in this scenario, and it depends on the connector that has it available, but for the FTP connector, what it does is it takes the last time, the date stamp of the file itself when it was last updated and, or created, and it will read that so that if, it, if when it checks the FTP server and it's at the, at the uh, scheduled frequency, and it says, oh, OK, actually, the file has never been updated, then it won't uh, process the rest of the job. It'll just say, hey, I don't need to run this uh, batch job. It's already been done. All right, so our frequency will go back to one day. We're going to set our start delay to 0 because I want it to start right away so we can see what's going on. And then what you're going to see here So what you're going to see here is basically a, 
after after it pu after it pulls this uh, after it pulls the file from here, it'll go ahead and convert it to uh, a Java object because again, if you remember, the file itself is a CSV. So we're going to go ahead and convert the file to, to to a Pojo so that we can go ahead and run this batch job. Okay. So now I'm going to create this batch operation, which is basically me going back to this uh, this meal flow and then I can our uh, meal palette. And I can go ahead and drag and drop this batch job, which has which which uh, allows me to go through it millions of records. Um, Mule is pretty performant, which is the runtime engine itself. Um, you have up to 16 threads to use, um, so you have to actually size your block size, which is how many records you want to process, uh, either concur uh, concurrently or synchronously, if you just set it to one. Um, so, because let's say you're trying to batch, uh, you're trying to process images as well. So imagine there's 16 threads times 10 megs. You're, you know, it adds up really quickly in terms of memory usage. Um, so, so the batch block size is something that you kind of can set and pre-configure uh, based on your needs and depending on what your data data is like. Uh, but anyway, that's all configurable. So for our batch job, we're going to have two records at a time come in and and we're, we're going to accept no failures. You could also set different failures and different failure modes, and you could actually set error handling through uh, this field, this area over here, where you could drag and drop from the meal palette any, how you want to uh, handle your errors. You could either propagate or you could continue, or you could custom define, define your error handlers based on the classes of your Salesforce or whatever um, you're, you're processing to, to or from. Um, so here's something that hopefully hasn't gotten screwed up because it's a live demo. But it's going to go ahead and propagate all of the, of course not. Um, all right, well, what it was doing was it was going, going ahead and as you could, if you can take a look at this, uh, Dataweave script over here. Dataweave is the proprietary uh, data transformation language that we have, um, which allows for really quick, fast uh, uh, data transformations, regardless of what your data type is. We support just about every single possible data format. Um, you could even customize and uh, provide your own data schemas. Uh, so if you have just not just X2 or EDI files, but really you name it, uh, you can pretty much process it and bring it into Dataweave to be transformed into anything else. Um, and I will be able to show you a different version of this, so just keep it in mind. Uh, it's just I deleted something for the demo because I thought it'd be a good idea. It's not. <laughs> it never changed demos. Um, so anyway, so if you could imagine going ahead and taking every single one of the records that came from the CSV that I had and transforming it and moving it around, um, basically to standardize and concatenate different things. Dataweave is actually a functional programming language, so you could do almost just about anything you want to your data, but you could also be declarative. So if you just needed one-to-one -one mappings, you could actually drag and drop from here uh, and just map it out from the visual editor. And you'll get to see that in a different demo that I have as well. Um, so then I'm just going ahead and I'm taking all the records, okay? In this case, only two, because there's only two records in my CSV. But I could actually set this to 10 or something else, something greater than my actual batch, uh, my batch job itself. That Because again, the CSV that I was taking in has two records only but it could be millions. It could be tens of thousands. And this will save you on API calls to Salesforce because you pay per API call. Um, so we can go ahead and run just one batch shot, uh, one call um, to Salesforce. And all I did for the Salesforce uh, bulk ups upsert is to just look for Salesforce and find bulk upsert and then just put it into here. Um, you go ahead and you can just configure it with all of your Salesforce credentials. And now it's available globally for any other flows. So imagine having 100 different uh, uh, transformation uh, ETLs uh, going, uh, flows going on. And you could use the same configuration. Again, reuse, time savings. Um, and then we're going to just take this uh, Pojo, and then we're going to go ahead and upload it uh, to, to Salesforce. And then hopefully, after it's done, it logs that it's complete. Um, so if I try to run this right now, it's going to break. But uh, don't do live demos like that. Um, anyway, so 
So we can go ahead and run the job. It might work. It might error. Let's see what happens. So, so Mule itself is completely mavenized um, as, as from uh, Mule 4. Um, so, and everything is isolated. So we have a lot of class uh, isolation. So first we load up a JVM, and all the JVM loads up each and every single class separately, and this and that. It gives you full protection um, from having data leak out. All right. Starting to run. It's booting up. Again, it's, I'm on a VM, so it's a little bit slower than normal. All right. So first, it booted up the runtime itself, spun up the JVM, loaded up the runtime, and now it's loading up the application, which sits on top of the runtime. So hopefully, after it's deployed, it'll run once, and we will see negative Ghost Rider. All right. Well, imagine that it said, yay, this was successful, and Rashid didn't delete the thing to make the, the demo more interactive. Um, but, OK, so that didn't work. But it does work. And you can find out for yourself and, uh, if you go through uh, the walkthrough. So that's for ETL integrations. I'm sorry that wasn't convincing enough, but I promise you it's pretty good. And best of all, you could handle millions and millions, hundreds of millions of records uh, really without a problem at all. I mean, I've, I've, seen, I've seen basically a, a machine running on one gig of RAM be able to process a full gig in minutes. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Um, uh oh, questions already? Okay, to ask questions as you go. Um, you prefer at the end? I usually prefer it at the end. Um, yeah, but hopefully not too many questions on that one. I promise you, it works. Just live demo. These are just how things go. That's why I put things in a VM so they don't crash, and that's why you don't change things. All right. Anyway. Let's forget that. So that's for that's for uh, that, that's for basically the integration that's the integration type that's most important to you guys, uh, typically from what I've seen. But that doesn't fully utilize and talk about the breadth of our platform. So let's let me go through that. So let me start off uh, in the uh, software development lifecycle by being an architect. All right. So when I'm an architect and I'm building an API. Um, a lot of you guys are really familiar with API specifications, right? How many of you know about OAS, Swagger, uh, RAML? Just two, three, four, okay, we're getting there. All right, so APIs are getting more and more popular these days. And there's a lot of really good reasons for that. Um, it's basically, if you want anything that's reusable, consumable, um, and really gain adoption and traction, APIs are the way to go because it allows people to use your platform, your software, your tools, and interface with it. Um, so at MuleSoft, what we found is that building an API specification actually has uh, a lot of unique features that, has, that nobody else has actually tapped into. And this is what makes MuleSoft and AnyPoint platform really, really, really special. Um, so with our platform, we have uh, any, within our AnyPoint platform, uh, let's say I'm an architect, and I go, hey, I'm Rashid, and I want to build an API. So what I can do is I can go ahead and go into what's called Design Center, go to Create, and then I can go ahead and create a new S API specification. So let's go to one that I've, already, that I've already made. So this API specification, which I'm going to enlarge so that everyone can see, so this API specification is written in RAML, uh, RESTful API modeling language. Um, you could also uh, create, or if you already have, actually, if you have OAS or Swagger files, files you could actually even import them, um, and it'll convert it to RAML as well. Uh, the thing that makes RAML special is that it's really machine friendly. So, so what does that mean? Well, RAML gets, lets you very, very, very definitively define your data types, which you don't get with Swagger necessarily, so it's something that kind of needs to be done. You could set examples, and it's great for documenting and human consumption, 
but RAML is excellent for human and machine consumption. So that's what, what we have here. So an API specification is a contract. So I'm, right now, I'm defining the contract of this API. So I'm saying, hey, this is the title. This is a products API. It's version number. And this is the, uh, the path where the root path where the API calls can be made to. Um, and next line, number, line number seven, I'm going and talking about the different security schemes that I support. We, we support, with RAML, you can uh, put in BASIC, OAuth, you, really you name it. Um, you could even custom define your own uh, security pro types if you want to. Um, and then I'm saying that this whole entire API is just secured by BASIC auth. And below that, I'm going ahead and I'm defining all the, the different data types um, that my products will have. And now, over here at line 57, over here at line 57, I'm going ahead and I'm defining my endpoints. I only have one endpoint. It's a products API. Uh, it's a products endpoint endpoint that just takes a URI param of uh, product ID, which is in this case a string. Um, it could be it could be um, numbers or whatever. But again, your API gets to be strictly typed. Um, I only support one method, which is get. And my response on a 200 is basically going to give a, is going to respond back with this product data type that I've defined above. And I've also included an example of what it's going to look like and also what a 404 error would be. So looking in my, looking over here on the right, we can actually see that. And this is really similar if you guys have seen API specs with Swagger. Um, you get the view of what the res different responses are. You can see what all the types are for the data set, as well as the example itself that I've included. Um, and this is the best part. And this is what makes any point platform pretty amazing. So I'm an architect. I go, you know what? This API spec looks amazing. I'm ready to go ahead and have people create an implementation. And I also want people to consume it. So the, re the reason why I have these different codes, and you'll see in a second, or costumes, I guess you could say, um, is that normally you have to have your implementation done first. And then any sort of consumers and clients of your API have to basically be come in after. With any, any point platform, that does not need to be the case. You could actually have parallel development. And how is that possible? Well, we have what's called a mocking service. And this mocking service allows anyone to go ahead, including yourself. I can go ahead and do it through this console. So I can put in any credentials that I want, because it is a fake service, but it's a service that can be tested against. And I'm going to provide just a product ID, anything that I want. It doesn't really matter, because again, it's a mocking service. All we want to know is basically, all we want right now is just to have something we could test against. So I send it out, and I get this response back. I can basically take this URL. I can now give this URL to anyone who's developing a consumer application. And they can go ahead and develop before my implementation has ever even started. So now, great. I have this API specification. I can go ahead and publish it to what we call Exchange, which is our version of a app exchange, but it's a API exchange. So you can go ahead and uh, see what APIs are available to me within my organization. How do I, how do I consume it? How do I interact with it? Um, and I can go ahead and also gain access to it, if it, it, depending on the security protocol that it has. So I could request access all from one UI. To, to, this, uh, to this API. So great. I've gone ahead and I've published this API. I've created it. I'm an architect. I'm done. My, my role is done. So now I'm going to hand it off to my developer. So my developer is going to go in. My developer is going to go in. And he's gonna, he or she is going to take, huh? Oh, yeah, sorry. You're right. <laughs> Slacking off. It's hot. So 
my, oh God, it's hot. So my developer's gonna come in, okay? Great. My developer's gonna come in, and he or she is going to go ahead and create a brand new meal project. And I'm gonna, you could call it whatever you want, but the beauty is that I can go ahead and I can take that API specification that I went ahead and I developed, and I could actually import that in um, if we just find it here. So we could just say quick start store, and I can import that, that API specification in. And what uh, this tool right here, this IDE, which is called AnyPoint Studio, will do is it will go ahead and scaffold as much as it can from that API specification for me without writing a line of code. So what does that mean? So that means that my HTTP listener, my HTTP listener, which is here, uh, will basically uh, get placed back into the can onto the canvas. I have my different error methods defined and the endpoint as well, which is on a get method of product slash product ID. Um, also gets put into place. All without writing a single line of code, all without really any interaction other than me creating the project and importing that API specification. So I've already saved minutes, maybe even longer depending, but imagine trying to code all of this, right? This actually exponentially, has al you've already saved time by writing that API specification first. So now I can go ahead, so I would start off by Again, like you saw with the FTP connector, only that this is done so that so I don't have to mess it up um, <laughs> because I don't remember all the different things. But you can go ahead and configure whatever host, what protocol, if you need to add any certs or anything like that. Um, we support just about everything and anything because we want you to be able to connect anything to everything. So I'm just listening to slash API, uh, which it automatically did uh, because my API specification actually uh, defines it as slash API. Um, and then I'm going to go down to my endpoint. So I have this endpoint over here, my product ID. And what I did, just like before, I went to my database connector, and I selected the select statement from uh, the database connector. And I just dragged that onto the canvas over here. So let's see what the select statement connector does or looks like. Well, I don't think I could resize this. Anyway, um, so right now I have it set and configured to uh, be to connect to MySQL. We actually support pretty much any kind of database you want because all you need to do is import the JDBC driver and done. So you don't have to look around for different connectors. You could even write your own. Uh, drivers, should you be so inclined? I don't, I don't know if that's your thing. Um, but anyway, simple enough. I just go ahead and install the JDBC driver. I go ahead and I put in whatever credentials that I need, um, select which database that I want to read off of, and I hit test. And then we will see that the test connection was successful. So already you could see how long it would take normally for me to code it out and create a database, uh, uh, well, not a connector, but basically an implementation with, uh, to connect to a database. So then I go ahead and I just put in my, uh, my SQL uh, query. So in this scenario, I put in a join, because everyone loves joins. I don't know why. Um, it's a thing for you guys, all you database guys. So there's a join. It's taking two, uh, two databases. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, two tables, and putting them together. Uh, to basically give me product information to match my uh, API specification. Because again, an API specification is a contract. All right, now we're going to go back into uh, the data weave transformation tool. So I'm going to hit transform, drop that in. And here you could see what I was talking about, where you have the mapping. So you can go ahead and drag and drop if it's, um, if it's just a declarative uh, map of your data. or if, let's say, you wanted to use the full power of DataWeave, because it is a functional uh, uh, data transformation language, you can go ahead, and in this scenario, I'm using the read operator to take a, a stringified JSON 
and transforming it into JSON itself. Because again, DataWeave supports just about any data type, including ones that you can custom define. Imagine being able to convert any data to any data. So, and then it's not just any data to any data. Those schemas that you've created, the functions that you might want to create, if you create custom functions, you could actually import, share, reuse. The biggest thing that I'm trying to drive home, and you'll see, is this idea of reuse. So, great. I've gone ahead and I've created this thing. It looks great. Um, I know that the, the, the data over here, which was actually all these uh, fields that you're seeing over here that I'm mapping to, all the metadata was actually provided for by the API specification. Because remember, we defined all the data types for that endpoint. So it read that API specification, and it knows what the data is supposed to look like at the end, right? because this is the last connector at the end of my flow over here for this endpoint. So it knows what it's supposed to output, and it knows what it's supposed to in input, what it gets as an input from my select, uh, um, from my database select over here. So I can go, so it makes it really easy to map by being aware of, of the different metadata by running a simple quick query first and also reading the API specification. So now you've saved a ton of time. You know that the data is right. You're going to meet your API specification contract because you don't really have a choice because it's right there in front of you. Um, yeah, you could, hit a, you could throw a null, but I mean, it'll, it'll tell you can't. But anyway, so this is great. So let me just do a one-click run and see if this thing works or if I messed it up. All right, so it's filled, finished building my jar. It's launching the JVM. It's uh, loading up the runtime. By the way, I never knew that the hoodie thing was a developer thing until pretty recently. It kind of clicked. All right, great. My application is loaded and running. Localhost 8081, products, and then API, and then the product ID. That's my URL. Hopefully, you guys can see it. I know it's a little bit small. I'm going to hit Enter, cross my fingers. Cross my fingers. Oh my god, <laughs> Safari. Um, here, we'll do this instead. Let's just curl it. Oh, what, what's on Windows? Who's a Windows person? Ping? Well, I actually want the data, though. Ping doesn't work for localhost. <laughs> Anybody know something other than Saf All right, I'll do that. How about ping 0.0000? 0 .0 hmm. Just so you know, 0.0.0, .0, .0 is everything, including localhost. But let's see if Windows is different. I don't know. Oh, Windows is different. OK, so let's change localhost. Curl. No, curl, sorry. Well. Hmm, ping doesn't like it. All right, so let's do Let's do this.
It's not my day. <laughs> it's not even showing up. <sighs> well, anyway, this is what it looks like, faking it. But this is a deployed service in our cloud instance. Darn it. All right, well, losing my steam now. All right, anyway. So, so let's imagine that it deployed and I'm not having weird network issues, probably because I'm on JVM now and something weird happened before. Um, oh, actually, maybe I need to close Java processes. Anyway, um, so, so OK, fine. My implementation, my implementation was done, let's say. I can go ahead if I want to. Uh, let's, say, let's say I'm done actually just, just creating it. I want to run some tests on it. We have this testing suite called MUnit. You can go ahead and right click. Configure it, blah, 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 and then run tests. Um, and if you want to actually deploy it to our uh, cloud instance, you could right click it, deploy to Cloud Hub, and it's basically one click deployment to our uh, cloud service. Um, so it makes it pretty quick and easy to deploy. And I'm not going to wait for that. Um, so, anyway. So that's for deployment. So now that's, that's me as a developer. So what if, what if I am a uh, admin? And I want to have, I want to go ahead and consume from that uh, service as well. Well, we have this tool also called Flow Designer. Um, so you might, it might be confusing. I didn't know you guys had that in <laughs> Salesforce. But, um, <laughs> Uh, so we have this uh, we have this other tool called Flow Designer, uh, which is really which I realized the parity between admins and the user base that we target. Um, so let's say you're a Salesforce admin, um, and you want to create an integration where you're a client of that service that's now been created, tested, and deployed to the cloud service. So and I want to just let's say let's say the story is I have a bunch of Salesforce leads. Um, that has, and there's a custom field of products, right? But I, I, I don't want just a product ID. I want to actually have like the rich, full amount of product information, and I want to send that send that out to my. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what ADs are, but you know ADs are people who just make cold calls. Um, so so I want every single week on Monday morning, I want them to basically get a list of. Uh, a bunch of different leads and all the products that they bought and what upsell potential that might exist, right? And arm them with all of that. So again, the decision is, do I want to be event-driven or do I want to be scheduled? If you have a uh, RESTful API like we created with the implementation, it's event-driven. For this, every Monday morning, scheduled. So let's look at the scheduler. So, so again, I'm not going to run down a cron. I'm just going to set it for, I'll say, f three minutes. So really quickly, I went ahead. Every three minutes, it's going to go ahead and start this process. Um, so what I did here, I've got Salesforce. Again, I'm running another. I'm, this time, I'm running a, a Salesforce query uh, using a SoQuill. Um, so I don't know if it's actually pronounced that way. I've only read it. I haven't heard it. I'm new to Salesforce. Um, so, so anyway, I can go ahead and hit the uh, plus button. Let me backtrack. Just go over here, hit the plus button, and select Salesforce. And then it'll, I can go ahead and select the query operator. And it'll automatically add it to my canvas. And now, because I want an array of leads, I'm just going to run a select statement that gets back my I the IDs, the first names, last names, companies, email, blah, 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 including this custom field from all my leads. Great. Now I've got a bunch of leads, um, and which, is, which is an array of leads. Okay, so 
each this array of leads, I need to iterate through it and get that product ID and actually aggregate the data together to m enrich it with all the product information. So I'm going to go ahead and run this for each, which I can easily configure. It could either, either be synchronous with one or it could be asynchronous with many, um, depending on what your needs are. So you could actually go through a for each with two records at a time, four, whatever, uh, depending on what you need. So I've got my for each loop. Now, this is what I meant by also reusability and also by accelerating development. Remember that API specification? So not only am I able to develop this at the same time as my implementation, but it also built this, uh, this consumer connector out of the box with the API specification. No code needed. I can go ahead and hit any endpoint that I want from my service. It's available to me. I can go ahead and just search for it. And I can just drag and drop it onto my canvas. And now, without any code, I can go ahead and consume from the mocking service, and then eventually, when it's ready, from the actual implementation of the service as well, all without writing a single line of code. And again, the two developments are happening in parallel. So just imagine how much time you're saving in a big org with a ton of projects going on. So I can go ahead. I've, I've already got that uh, connector uh, loaded up. I'm just going to go ahead and extract each one of the, each one of the, uh, the leads, the, uh, the custom field, which is just the ID. And I'm going to go ahead and search. If you remember from our API specification, the only uh, parameter that we need, the URI parameter that we need, is the product ID, which we have. Ha ha, who would have thought? Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and take the product leads. And as you can see, there's a lot of one-to-one -one mapping. So I can just go ahead and drag and drop, right? But I'm going ahead and I'm aggregating between multiple sources. Hmm. Anyway, I'm going ahead and I'm dragging and dropping between multiple sources. All right, I've got products which is from the, uh, the products API that I've created and mocked, all right? And I have all the lead information, and I'm going ahead and I'm aggregating each lead and putting them into uh, my outbound as, in this scenario, it's going to be a CSV, which this is data weave, so I can define what my output's gonna be. In this scenario, it's CSV. I am I am concatenating uh, my existing uh, array that I have, which is just a variable that I've defined. And I'm adding to this array, one at a time, with this is the script version and this is the visual version. So you can go ahead and either write it all in script if you actually have functions, because again, it's a functional transformation language. So if you have anything that is not declarative that you can just one-to-one -one map, uh, you can go ahead and write your functions. And then I just hit close. And I've got this going to Slack, uh, because Slack is really easy to actually gain value from. And you know I don't want you guys to see my email. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and now put this to Slack. And it's, an, it's going to upload the file. It's this is the name of the CSV. And it's going to put it to the right people. Because again, I want it to go to the right channels, the right people. Um, if we wanted to email, you could use email. If you wanted to just upload to an FTP, you could upload to an FTP. You kind of name it. Uh, AnyPoint platform allows you to integrate anything to anything, with anything. Um, well, actually with AnyPoint platform. But, um, anyway, so I can go ahead and, s and basically cross my fingers, hit run, wait a bit for the application to load up. So it's starting up. It says it's running. So I have Slack. Hopefully, after it finishes fully booting. Oh. Today's not my day. Oh, actually.
<laughs> Live demos. Let's see what's going on here. Product as JSON. Fully. <sighs> All right, you know. We have good days and we have bad days. Today is an interesting one. All right, while the worker is restarting, um, I guess I'll just start taking Q and A's and I don't know. Sorry, that wasn't like a, I promise you everything really does work normally. I don't know, it's just like, this is actually what gave me a headache today because everything last second just stopped working. But um, if you want to find out more, <clears throat> if you want to find out more also, you can always go ahead and actually try it yourself. We have a bunch of quick start guides that actually lets you do this hands on. Um, yeah, this is actually like the same demo that I demoed at Trailhead X if any of you guys saw me. So I promise you it worked. <laughs> I don't know what's changed. But uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Daniel. So, sorry, for those uh, who don't know a lot about MuleSoft, like nothing, uh, can you just back up a bit and talk about how it works? Like yeah. um, how it's deployed and, and is it a cloud thing? So, so there's so many different things. Um, so. So let's start off with the base, which is Mule, which is the runtime itself. Um, it was founded in 2009 um, by an individual named Ross Mason who saw a problem where he was basically integrating the same exact thing over and over again in just different little iterations. And basically he realized, hey, why do I have to spend six months basically doing the same thing over and over? So he created this really uh, flexible runtime that basically has allowed it to transform and exist even in 2009 without significant changes to its core. Um, that's pretty incredible, to be honest with you, from an engineering standpoint. Um, so, so, so that's the runtime itself, OK? So we went from having that runtime um, to then also finding the need to have to finding the need to also add some visual elements because really it's it you could you can go ahead and you code you can code everything in just XML. Um, you can reference all of your connectors and everything else. Uh, you could develop your custom connectors and then reference it in your application in XML. But then that wasn't all that fun and efficient. So instead, they built this IDE which is called Studio, and that's also part of the AnyPoint platform. So we have this IDE. It's a real powerhouse. You can literally make just about anything with this. Um, again, that's why it's for if I have the hoodie on. Um, so, so, that, so, so, studio, so that's what Studio is for. It's basically, you need to do something really powerful, OK, use Studio. If you need to create quick, easy integrations, especially client, client ones, uh, use Flow Designer, which is another tool. And then the other thing that I showed as well was for the architect audience, because again, our platform covers the whole entire life cycle, right? So if I, am, if I need to design, we've got tools to, de to design your API or your integration. We have tools to develop. We have tools to deploy, as in we have this cloud service called Cloud Hub. We have tools to test. We have management capabilities as well. So we, we also have a really robust uh, API management um, set where you can go ahead and you can um, add custom policies, use out-of-the-box uh, policies. You can gain or grant, uh, gain, uh, grant or deny access to uh, client applications, right? The applications that you actually deployed. Remember, I said if you go to, uh, we have this wonderful thing called Exchange, 
which allows you to uh, share your assets as well as what are, what's also available from the public and community um, and be able to consume it. We have all these connectors and really everything to make things as easy as possible. Um, you could pretty much name it. I know someone's going to ask me for, let's say, NetSuite, right? So we have a connector for NetSuite. We, right? A bunch of different things for NetSuite. All right. We even have, we even have templates and examples that are built in that you could also share with other people. Right, within your organization, again, to expedite development of your actual applications. Um, yeah, our, our product is really aimed towards this whole idea of reuse and expediting de development and deployment. There's really no other tool that offers such a cohesive package and fully utilizes something like an API specification like our platform does. And Exchange, builds on top of that by offering not just, uh, not just sharing and utilization of an API specification, but really almost any work that you've done. Your implementation, your connectors, everything exists within Exchange to be shared and reused by whoever, uh, as a organization admin, uh, you deem necessary. Because you can break it up, you can break up your organization to different parties and different parts. Let's say you're also in different regions and you need to follow some laws and regulations, you can go ahead and segregate that out. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers some of that question. Yeah, that's great. I have one more question. So that you, you build these jars and you host them in your soft cloud or on-premise on or some AWS or all of those? Great question. Sanjana. AWS. So OK, here, let me answer it now. And then I will end. And if there's anything else, um, so right now, our Cloud Hub platform, uh, Cloud Hub uh, service, it, uh, it runs on AWS, right? And um, we, we are actually working towards actually uh, allowing you to deploy. So you could do AWS. You could do Cloud Hub. You could also do on-prem, obviously, um, because again, our runtime is super flexible. You could also do hybrid, and our agent will figure it all out. Um, but also, we are enabling, uh, we have plans for the future to enable uh, deployments to GCP and Azure. Yeah, so super flexible. We don't care. We want you to integrate whatever to whatever. We're very agnostic. So this seems, the, the exchange seems like, like the, the GitHub of connectors. That is true, but not just connectors. Uh, and integrators. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is actually my private exchange. Okay. Um, so I exist in the MuleSoft organization, but there's also just me, right? I don't have anything NetSuite, but and I have other stuff. Share that with others so you have yeah, yeah. Again, so you can actually, we have what's called access management, which you can actually uh, segregate bet uh, your organization out depending on what whatever levels you need to. You can add uh, users to different organizations. You could provide them with different roles. Uh, you could also create different environments for those organizations. You get to really slice it and dice it how you need to. Yeah, there's also a share ability within each uh, asset itself where you basically can, you have the flexibility to share with anybody else who's, who might not be actually provisioned. But you have permission to and share so it. For like, integrating something from Salesforce, if I wanted to share that, and, and it was all standard objects, I would share that, but it would be totally separate from the login credentials, so everybody could use it on their own organization. That is correct, yes. Yeah. And, and, and you, can, you can control your authorizations uh, as well uh, for your assets, um, like I showed a second ago. So, so if you have, yeah, anyway, yeah. And there's different methods for that, too. Um, you know, if you, if you just wanted to, because uh, when you deploy to our cloud service, let's say, um, you know, you can actually, on deployment, either through an automated process or uh, uh, just actually typing it in, during deployment, you could actually set uh, 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 properties that you can reference later on in your app. So for credentials, yeah.
Anybody else have any other questions? Man, that really bums me out. <laughs> Sorry, we're developers. We know nothing ever works the first time. This isn't the first time? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So in your ETL, uh, do you support um, like moving related records? Like, uh, you know, for example, with the accounts and the contacts together. So, 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 yeah, can you repeat the question? Actually, can, it's kind of hard to hear. Does he have yeah, a mic? Yeah, I think we need to turn this down and just get a lot of feedback. Testing, testing. Okay. Oh, there we go. 804. Wow. Success. <laughs> Good old restart. I think you showed this in the other in this direction where you were pulling things out of Salesforce. But when you're putting things into Salesforce, yeah. uh, do you support like putting in like like multiple tables that are with related content, like con contacts related to an account? Um, you showed, I think the demo you showed like loading one table, but can you load multiple tables at a time? So, with so. Dependencies. With dependencies, with dependent records. So, so in that scenario, you would actually need more complex logic to uh, validate and verify that. It almost doesn't seem like it's on. Yeah. Um, but the answer is that yes, this is possible. But it wouldn't be the simple way that I showed. But yes, we, yeah. And, and once you did it once and it succeeded, you have the rest. Yeah, exactly. I think the example with, for that would be the Canary with IO. It's an uh, online tool we use for using data load. The example for that will be dataloader.io, right? Yes. So it actually runs on, on top of the mule. Yeah. And it, it has abilities to insert dependent object data like for example if i'm inserting a contact and i wanted to find out a con by by name or something like that there is a way to configure all those things and it is a classic example of use of doing the same thing yeah so dataloader.io is actually like another <coughs> product almost of ours i mean it is ours um and it's actually a really popular thing it's just like it's not we don't necessarily say it's part of any point platform i'm not really a pricing expert or et cetera. We just know that we sell it. You could buy it. It'll only make your life easier and let you do that much easier. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. I know it's a little bit of a high stress thing coming here with the acquisition talks and all that, but we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Yeah.